This Commitment 2012 special, Conversation with the Candidate. Tonight, Congressman Ron Paul. Good evening and welcome to Conversation with the Candidate. I'm James Pendle. Our guest this evening is Congressman Ron Paul. For the half hour, we'll be getting to know who the candidate is and where he stands on key issues. At the start tonight, questions will come from me, and after a break, we'll bring in questions from our studio audience in a town hall format. But before we begin with the questions, it's time to get a quick look at the candidate's biography. Ron Paul's first campaign stop after announcing his candidacy was Exeter. I am a candidate for the presidency in the Republican Party primary. Paul was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on August 20th, 1935. He and his wife Carol now live in Lake Jackson, Texas. They have five children and 18 grandchildren. One of those children is Rand Paul, the junior senator from Kentucky. Paul got a degree in biology from Gettysburg College in Pennsylvania, where he was also on the track and swim teams. He then went on to Duke University School of Medicine. The congressman served as a flight surgeon in the U.S. Air Force in the 1960s, and after his time in the military, he focused his medical career on obstetrics and gynecology. Dr. Paul has delivered more than 4,000 babies. Congressman Ron Paul has represented Texas's 14th district since 1997. He was also elected to serve Texas's 22nd district during the late 1970s and early 1980s. This is Paul's third run for the White House. The first came back in 1988 when he ran as a libertarian. He also ran back in 2008, finishing fifth in the New Hampshire primary, but gained national attention for his fundraising and grassroots support. Well, Dr. Paul, thank you for coming in. Thank you. Nice to be with you. So this is your third time running for president. Why are you running again? To win. <laughs> <laughs> and the country has moved in the direction of the Constitution and limited government out of desperation because the things we've been doing for so many years, and especially since the bailout started and the crisis that we've had in the last couple of years, the people have looked at it and said, our policies are wrong. They were wrong in leading us up to the problems we had, and they're wrong in trying to get us out of it. And people are frightened and concerned, and they're very worried about the economic crisis. And I've been talking about this for 30 years, warning about it and saying, you know, we're in for big trouble. And people are looking for answers. So I think it's very appropriate that uh, they are now looking at free market economics and the, ec and the Constitution to find our answers. Yeah, you've been described as the godfather of the Tea Party movement. Do you embrace that sort of title? Well, I, I don't know if that's negative or positive. <laughs> so I haven't invented it. I don't use it. I don't deny it. If it means that I, uh, I helped start it, yes, yeah, certainly. And it wasn't me personally as much as the supporters in 07, because it was during that campaign that the supporters of the Ron Paul presidential campaign got together, and they were going to have a day of celebration of the original Tea Party uh, event, which was uh, the 16th of, uh, of December. So in 07, they did that, and they raised like $7 million and broke all kinds of records. So that was really the modern-day origination of the Tea Party movement. Today, it's much bigger and more amorphous. There's a lot of different people involved, and anybody who is concerned and unhappy with what's going on with the federal government uh, can call themselves a Tea Party member. You know, I read that you first really got involved in politics uh, right after the U.S. got off the gold standard. Uh, in plain language, why was that such a big deal? Well, it was a big deal because I had been uh, involved in studying free market economics, which is called Austrian economics, throughout the 60s. And the predictions were made back then that it was unsustainable uh, because the system was set up, uh, interestingly enough, it was set up uh, an organization meeting at, in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, and it was called the Bretton Woods Agreement. And it was deeply flawed from the very beginning because it was a pseudo gold standard. The American people weren't on a gold standard. They weren't even allowed to own gold, but the American dollar was backed by gold to foreigners. So there was some restraint on our spending and the printing of money, and that kept things re under reasonable control. By 1971, Richard Nixon said, no more, we're running out of gold, we can't do this, we need tariffs and all this other thing. So it was a big event. It meant to me that there would be no limits on spending and no limits on the printing press machine, and just look at what's happened in these last 30, 40 years. Uh, the spending has skyrocketed, the size of government has skyrocketed, our exposures around the world have skyrocketed, 
the inflation of the currency, the depreciation of the money, that has skyrocketed. And it comes because there are no restraints on the creation of money. It's like when it happened, I said, wow, we're legalizing counterfeit to the politicians. They're supposed to protect the value of our money. And they're legalizing counterfeit and the world trusted us and they still do to, to, to a large degree but less so than they used to as long as you print the money we can spend it and that has that has led to this horrendous bubble that has now burst and we're trying to deal with it let me ask you about another topic uh, really on the minds of a lot of Republicans particularly this cycle is immigration do you believe that immigration is fundamentally a federal issue or do states have the right to come in when the federal government doesn't do their job as, as some governors might I believe. I think in a guarded way, yes, the states have some responsibilities. Uh, but, but borders and, uh, and, and border guards and uh, visas and, and, and uh, passports, that's, that is a federal matter. But, uh, you know, in some ways, uh, even private landowners should have something, about, something to say about trespassing. Because, you know, if you're in Texas and you own a big ranch and thousands of people are coming over, I mean, uh, the, even the ranch owner isn't allowed to call the police and say, hey, there are hundreds of people on my land and they're trespassing. So there should be some responsibility to the state and they're willing to do it, but they're usually inhibited by the federal government and uh, they're not allowed to do it. What would you describe to be your greatest career accomplishment? Calling attention to something very important, and that is what should the role of government be? And to me, the role of government ought to be the protection of liberty. And it's done through the Constitution, and the Constitution was written to restrain the government and not the American people. And from that basic principle that more people are looking at and understanding comes the free market and sound money and prosperity and peace. And those are the consequences of understanding that, uh, that basic principle. The founders understood it clearly. And uh, I think I've helped to get people's attention and also to emphasize the fact that freedom shouldn't be chopped up into pieces. You shouldn't have personal liberty and economic liberty. It's all one because you have a right to your life, you have a right to your liberty, and you have a right to your property and pursue your happiness and take care of yourself. So I want to put that all back together. And I think I've gotten a lot of people to understand that because uh, when they realize how important that is, you'll realize that the solution to many of our problems can be found in that basic principle. Great. Well, that does it for this segment. Coming up right after the break, we'll bring in our studio audience to this conversation. Stay right with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Conversation with the Candidate, Congressman Ron Paul. It's time to bring in questions from our audience. I'll jump in from time to time if I need to for a follow-up. Follow -up. But for now, let's get right with our first question, Joe from Bedford. Go ahead. Thank you, and good evening, Congressman. Good evening. I was wondering if you could share with us what your thoughts were relative to what the most pressing priorities to solve the federal deficit are. The, the best way, and as far as I'm concerned, the only way we should solve the problem of the deficit is to cut spending and not raise taxes. I don't believe in that. Taxes are too high. Government is too big. We're doing too many things. And the only way you can really cut spending is for the people to understand what the role of government should be. And the, role, the proper role of government ought to be to protect our freedoms, not to police the world, and not to run an entitlement system. So as long as the people demand that, it's going to be virtually impossible for the politicians to do the right thing. A lot of people now are saying, you guys better balance the budget and do the right thing, but don't mess around with what I'm getting. So my proposal in the order of, of preference here is I think we still can have priorities. Um, for instance, I think it would be much easier for us to look at the spending overseas than to, child, to cut child health care and therefore we can have priorities. And not too many people are willing to. Instead of cutting back on our wars around the world, uh, we're adding to them with even without permission of the Congress. I mean, we're involved in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Libya, Somalia, and, and we're building bases. We're in 130 countries, 900 bases. We are blowing up bridges and infrastructure in a country. Then we go in and you have to pay to rebuild it again. At the same time, our infrastructure is falling apart. I say cut that massively. And then there's a, quite a few other programs I'd cut in this country. A lot of departments I would get rid of too. But there's room to cut without putting on the top of the list health care. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We're going to now go to 
We're going to go to Bill from Nashua. Go ahead. Thank you, Representative Paul. It's a real pleasure to be with Thank you here this evening. Recent headlines indicate that our economy is slowly making progress, with the exception of some recent headlines. Do you see that continuation or the continuation of that progress, and if so, any obstacles we should be aware of? I'm not as optimistic as some of the statistics. Yes, there are some numbers that are mostly government numbers, but the people who are unemployed, they're not waiting for a double dip, they're in one big dip. And the, the numbers are fudged. Uh, uh, I've been around and checked these figures, and if the government tells you, yeah, you have a 2% inflation, I don't think a lot of people believe that anymore because go and look at your gasoline prices, your cost of medicine, your cost of food. It's going up much more rapidly. They say unemployment is 8.9, 9.1, like a big difference. If you go back to the old measurement of unemployment, it's probably over 20%. And that's why the people feel badly. So these statistics that seem to be slightly improved, they're improved because you – pumped in a lot of money. The taxpayer and the Federal Reserve, by diluting the value of the money, pumped in trillions of dollars. So Wall Street did better and a couple of businesses to get, got better. And the people who should have gone bankrupt didn't go bankrupt. But the people are poorer for it because all these bad assets that had to be bought up and they had no market for it, instead of liquidating them and get them off the books, they ended up on our books. And it's all done. The Federal Reserve can spend trillions of dollars in secrecy. And we're not even allowed to know about it. I'm doing investigations of that right now in a subcommittee I chair. And a third of the money the Fed printed into the trillions of dollars went to overseas banks. You know, that is, that is what's so bad about it. So I'm, I'm not optimistic about the statistics. I think we're in for big trouble. I think next year there's going to be a horrendous tax placed on American people in the form of higher prices which means the, devalue of the devaluation of the currency. But I'm very optimistic that more and more people in this country have awakened and they know what the trouble is and they know we should, you know, bite the bullet and decide on, on a new policy, new monetary policy, new fiscal policy, pay attention to the Constitution. And there's a good reception there. And I know the younger generation, the college people, have been very supportive of what I've been talking about. So I'm very optimistic that so many people have been introduced to the ideas, the ideas that aren't new and they're not mine. They're the ideas that made America great and we've given up on it. We, we don't have the trust and the faith in the free markets that we can take care of ourselves, and we don't need the nanny state, the government, to tell us everything and, tell, and take care of us in cradle grave. So short term, I'm rather pessimistic, especially for next year, but long, longer term, I'm optimistic. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Paul, we're going to now move on to foreign policy. We have a question from Ellen from Merrimack. Hello. Welcome, Congressman. You've been concerned about um, defense mission creep overseas. And in the de recent defense reauthorization bill, I know that you objected to uh, failure to define enemy in that bill. You were concerned that the mission was so vague, money was being given without accountability. If something like that crossed your desk as chief executive, would you veto it and send it back for language like that? I would absolutely veto it. I mean, that, that whole bill was... Uh, you know, way too much militarism and very little national defense. But the provision she's referring to is the changing of the definition that allows the president to go to war. It was opening up the doors, and it was, it, the word I think was associated groups. Anybody associated, and it was undefinable. It was so vague that if you happen to belong to a peace group, and you're, you're participating in a group, a peace group that really wants peace and you work for it, and you donate money, you may be put on that list. So they were going to allow the military to target you as well as anybody in the world. It meant, uh, it's bad enough already that our presidents go to war without the consent of the people through a declaration of war, but this would have made it much worse. It's passed the House, not the Senate. Let's hope the Senate doesn't pass it, but I absolutely pro pro prohibit it. And if it were on the books when I was there, I would never use it. You know, Dr. Paul, uh, I was just thinking the other day, you're the only candidate running for president these days who's actually served in the military. Uh, what happened to the idea that you need to have this uh, military experience to be commander-in-chief? 
I don't is know. That, is that one of your main arguments? Uh, one of your new arguments, anyway? I, I would think that uh, it's good that uh, the American people know that, and my <laughs> staff keeps telling me, why don't you tell them about <laughs> your experience? But I was, I was in the military for five years, and uh, I, I tell my veterans groups, uh, you know, that I, uh, I, I was drafted and went in, and I went in, you know, I was taken out of my residency. I went in with a lot of reservation. It was the height of the Cuban crisis, but I figured, I'm going to make the best of it, you know, and it's, you know, I have to respond, and this is the way the system works, and I was very obedient. Matter of fact, I stayed in three extra years, so I had a total of five years uh, in, in the Air Force. But now I tell my veterans groups that now he's even not in a presidency position, but as a member of Congress on international relations, I have a responsibility with dealing with policy, so I see it differently. But I would think, yes, uh, that has helped me a whole lot. At the time, uh, you know, it was, it was a great burden, you know, to uh, raising my family and little kids and being drafted and all, but I did travel a lot. Matter of fact, I had been to the Middle East and Pakistan and Afghanistan and Iran at the time we could go in there and Ethiopia and Turkey and all these places and so it was an experience that was well worthwhile and you do understand uh, how the military operates uh, and uh, uh, I think it's a, a very worthwhile experience. I'm going to move back on to some fiscal issues. Alexander, I think you have some questions on entitlements. What is the first step you would take to transition from our current state of entitlements toward your ideal? Mm -hmm. Well, that, that one is tougher politically. It's tougher politically to just get rid of the entitlement system. But there's no, entit there's no authority in the Constitution for entitlements. But people, the reason why this is so overwhelming is we have been taught and we have been conditioned and the majority of the American people believe that entitlement means rights. It sounds like a right. You're entitled to this. But you're not entitled to somebody else's life and property, and the, uh, you, you, you can't go to your neighbor and steal, but you shouldn't be able to steal the send the politician to your neighbor and steal. So the moral principle and the constitutional principle is so clear. So you have to get people to understand that, but what's going to probably end the entitlement system is when we go flat out broke, and that's what we're approaching. But no, uh, you should do your best. I would t pick the priorities. I'm, I'm for cutting out the... Uh, the foreign entitlement, the foreign welfare and corporate welfare because it's easier, but then we have to look and say, look, the entitlement system isn't going to work. You know, we're broke and we should at the least start nibbling away at that and condition people. Why wait until we go totally bankrupt, but we should do our very best. But a president can't, you know, do that. He can do more in foreign policy because he's in charge of the troops. You, you don't have to keep troops in, uh, in, in nine, on 1,900 bases. The entitlement system has to be whittled away, whittled away uh, through, through the uh, you know, uh, legislation and through encouragement of the Congress. The President's obligation would be to, uh, you know, if necessary, uh, veto bills or encourage the Congress to pass more reasonable legislation. Dr. Paul, we now have Jane from Manchester asking uh, ask you a question Paul. about health care. Okay. Welcome to New Hampshire. Um, how would you make long-term care more affordable and accessible to our um, aging boomer population? <laughs> how do we make medical care more affordable with the, uh, the aging boomer population, which is growing uh, rather rapidly, and the costs are growing even more rapidly? Well, the cost of medical care... Uh, is not so simple as saying there's only one cause. It isn't because so-and-so charges too much money. It's much more complex. You have the problem of tort law, the lawsuits. That makes doctors do twice as much as they need to do, but they have to do it out of d defense. And I've been on the receiving end of that and say, boy, what if I don't do this C-section in three minutes and I'm looking at this curve, what is this attorney going to do to me? So it puts all kinds of pressures on you, and it does everything in the emergency room. So that's one problem, and I can't go into detail, but I have several pieces of legislation that would deal, that, deal with that with a free market approach where you could uh, get, get the attorneys out of getting most of that money, and that's where our, our big problem is. The other thing is, is um, inflation is when you increase money supply and devalue your currency, and then it goes into higher prices. You, and uh, you say, well, how would it just do medicine more than anything else? It can. Uh, when you devalue a currency, some prices go up, 
Some prices might even go down. Your computers and cell phones and TV prices might go down, but if government gets involved in allocating services, they don't give you better services, they give you higher prices. So where have we been most involved? The housing industry, we had a big bubble there. Medical care, we have huge costs there, and so they have to regulate and, and regulate prices. In education, they have pushed money into that. And it usually never improves services, uh, but it imp increases prices. So you can't solve your problem until you deal with the monetary issue. But then again, you need a lot more competition. I've spent a lot of time in my recent book dealing with this on how you should have more competition. You should have an opportunity for people to have alternative health care rather than making it illegal. And uh, in, in, in the medical profession does it. The insurance company does it, the drug companies do it, the management companies do it, and, and now there's so much, we, we have corporate medicine, both Republicans and Democrats have pushed this, and you have to reject that. You need more competition, and there are ways of doing it. The medical profession uh, has it so that uh, anybody outside of somebody with a medical degree can't prescribe anything, and that is not necessary. And there's a lot of options in alternative health care that are actually prohibited, and they shouldn't be. Well, con uh, Dr. Paul, I want to get quickly to an email question we have. Uh, it's Edward from Moultonboro. He says that we are very dependent on foreign oil. Would you eliminate current restrictions to the development of our own oil reserves in the Anwar and other areas within our boundaries? Did he say, uh, what was the, get would rid you, of the reserves, would, get rid of the restraints? The restrictions on drilling in those areas, yes. Oh, yeah, the, the market should be determining. The market should determine we shouldn't have restrictions on, uh, on drilling. The restrictions should be de dealt with through the market phenomenon. A lot of people want to restrict it be, for the so-called environmental reasons, but in a free market, you can protect your environment without having the bureaucrats telling you where to drill and where not to drill, because you don't have a right to pollute anybody's property or anybody's air or anybody's water. Uh, so we should have a lot more drilling. I mean, if you looked at all that we have in this country, everything from coal, uh, nuclear, and, and oil shale, I mean, we have tremendous amount, so we don't have to be. We send our troops over there to protect our oil, and that's what I think is so criminal. Uh, but the market works, and if for a while the prices go up, prices are very important. If it's a market price and prices go up, we might drive less. There might be alternatives. Uh, all of a sudden, the market helped us get natural gas prices down. Also, you know, a few years ago, in my district, they had a port they were building for importing natural gas because our prices were too high. And all of a sudden, there were a lot of discovery. They've turned that into an export of natural gas because, you know, it's, it's uh, unknown what we can do when the market operates. And uh, I happen to think that if the price of uh, gasoline and uh, hydrocarbons got too high, we'd have electricity, maybe generated by nuclear and have electric cars or something like that. But let me tell you, one thing with certainty, I don't know all the answers, the politicians in Washington don't know the answers, the bureaucrats don't, don't know the answers, that you know the market has to answer. You have to find out which is the best product and how to take what and how to deal with it. But the dependency, the fact that you might have imports is, shouldn't frighten us all because, because that's the way the markets are supposed to work. But if they cut it off and prices go up, believe me, as long as the people in this country have the freedom to develop alternatives, They'll happen. We shouldn't be frightened about freedom. It works. You know, Dr. Paul, I want to ask you a little bit of a question. I want to ask you a question about, a little bit about your previous profession. You've delivered 4,000 babies. What do you think is the biggest misconception that first-time parents have about pregnancy? You have a few seconds. Oh, boy. <laughs> didn't know I was going to get a medical question. Miss it may be more psychological, frankly. But well, I don't know. I think, I think women who are pregnant are pretty smart, <laughs> and they know what to expect. Uh, I think sometimes uh, they're a little more frightened than they have to be. That's a misconception, especially in this age. You know, they could hear stories. People have heard stories about how terrible some, some things could come about. Uh, come about. But in the modern age, uh, there's just not, no reason to be fearful. So, um, but basically, uh, 
I, I think I've always considered my patients pretty well informed and and uh, hopefully I kept them well informed. <laughs> I'm sure you did. <laughs> that does it all here for we have now for this program. Coming up next in our series of conversation with the candidate, Fred Carger will be making his appearance next Friday night. Carger is a former White House consultant, best known now as a gay rights activist. There's still time to send in questions via email. Just head to the politics section of WMER.com and click on the submit a question link. You can also pick a question for a specific candidate or for them all. And while we're signing off on television for tonight, this conversation with Ron Paul continues online. There you'll find a full 30 more minutes of questions from our studio audience. And you can also rewatch this half hour in case you missed something. Thanks a lot for watching and uh, check out WMUR.com. <laughs>